Why is your skeleton different from a snail's shell? Why is it so difficult to improve on a rock climbing personal best? And how do you get a rowing boat to move in a straight line? The answer to all of these questions is optimization. Optimization is a concept that means getting as close to a goal as possible, given certain constraints. Maths is helpful for this because it allows us to avoid the slow and painful process of trial and error, when we can instead use calculus to quickly identify the best strategy possible. So, what are the commonalities we see across optimization scenarios? Well, we need a goal first of all, and constraints that determine a number of different possible strategies that can get us some way towards that goal. While the calculus specific to different optimization scenarios can get very specific and complex, the concept itself can be applied to many fields. I'm going to take you through some applications of optimization in evolutionary biology, climbing and rowing. Let's get started. Living things like you and me exist because of organisation, but this needs a lot of energy to maintain. This is where optimization comes in. How do you make a body that needs the least energy but still does a lot of functions? We're going to focus on a body part common to both of us and most animals, the skeleton. First, we'll look at the diversity of skeletons across different habitats, and then the individual adaptations of some skeletons. Skeleton diversity is very desirable for animal evolution. This is because any variation will allow different species to adapt to new habitats and situations, meaning that individuals of each species can survive long enough to reproduce and pass on their genes. We can therefore define our optimization goal as the maximum number of skeleton types possible within the group we call animals. Now you might think that the number of possible skeleton types and combinations could go on forever, but surprisingly it is finite. This is because of constraints like the availability of materials to build skeletons, physical limitations like atmospheric pressure, and the incompatibility of some skeleton types. The different strategies in this case are the different components that can be combined to make up a skeleton. It can be hard to group skeleton types together since animals look so different from each other, but let's have a go. Our skeleton is mostly made of bone and cartilage cells, but other types of skeletons use different materials. Let's take a look at this insect. It has a hard skeleton like us, but on the outside of the body, and not made of cells. Instead, cells inside the insect make different molecules like chitin, which provide functions similar to that of living bone. Similarly, animals like snails have cells that make calcium carbonate into a hard shell. One big difference between the skeletons of insects and snails is the way that they grow. Human bone has cells that can grow and change shape, but a skeleton without living cells can't, limiting the growth of the soft body and meaning different solutions are needed. In the insect, the external skeleton is molted or shed periodically as the animal grows. You can think of how snakes shed their skin. While the snail's shell is grown only at the edges in a spiral pattern so that it doesn't grow right into the body itself. Another animal that you probably have never thought of having a skeleton is an earthworm. There are no hard parts in the skeleton, so internal pressure comes instead from water stored in special sections within the worm's body. The incompressibility of water means the sections can change shape, but not volume, creating resistance for the muscles of the worm to push against. This is called a hydrostatic skeleton. The many different types of skeleton have been summarised by researchers Thomas and Reif in The Skeleton Space. There are seven key categories of skeleton element in the skeleton space such as its growth process, and each of these contain two to four options, such as adding units, growing at the edges, or molting. This makes the skeleton space seven-dimensional, with 1,536 possible combinations of options. However, analysis of the space is generally simplified into two dimensions, that is, only looking at two options in combination instead of seven. This brings the number of skeleton types down rapidly to 186. We can also rule out eight pairs of elements that are incompatible. You can't have an internal skeleton that is also molted. Now, if these are theoretically the finite amount of skeleton options available for animals to evolve over time, how many types have actually been seen in nature? The answer is gratifying, very nearly all of them. But this diversity changes between different habitats because these will have different sets of constraints. Let's look at some cases where the constraints are pretty non-variable, comparing the sea, the land and the air. Out of all of these, the diversity of animal skeletons is greatest among those that live in the sea and smallest in animals capable of long flight. 
This is because there are additional constraints in the air that don't apply to land. Any flying skeleton would have to be light and have some sort of wing. This is not so problematic on the ground, where we see heavy boned vertebrates alongside light flightless insects. In the sea, even more options are available as the buoyancy provided by water removes the need for the skeleton to withstand gravity. In summary, the optimum number of skeleton types is determined by a combination of absolute constraints that become more specific if you narrow down the group of animals that you're talking about. Within these groups, each individual species will have a skeleton uniquely optimised to the constraints of its environment, prioritising certain functions over conflicting ones. In the case of humans, our own hard bones act like levers controlled by muscles, optimised for fast movement, but not for external protection, as we have behavioural adaptations to avoid danger instead. Optimization is also apparent in many sports, such as my personal favourite of climbing. Generally, the way that you climb really depends on your body type. A tall person will be able to easily reach what a short person might have to jump to, and a heavily muscled person can pull themselves up quickly, while someone lighter could hold themselves on the wall for longer. However, there are narrower constraints in a more recent climbing category called speed climbing, which is destined for inclusion in the next Olympics. As we can tell from the name, the goal of speed climbing is to get as quickly as possible to the top of a 15 meter wall, faster than anyone else in the competition. The difference between this and normal competitive climbing is that the climbers know exactly what the route is going to be beforehand, and will have trained on identical ones. The speed climbing wall is built exactly the same no matter where you try it, with a 5 degree angle of overhang, identical colour and roughness, and identical placement of identical holds. Now, we can easily tell by viewing the wall as a rectangle that the quickest route to the top is a straight line upwards, because this eliminates any extra time taken moving to either side. However, this optimum is hard to achieve in practice because of where the holds are positioned, forcing sideways movement. The straight line makes sense when we model the body as a particle, with its mass concentrated into a single point. But, the human body is much larger than a particle, and has limbs of different lengths so its mass is not evenly spread. Instead, we model climbers using their approximate centre of mass, the point around which body mass is evenly distributed. This will vary between athletes, as people with bigger legs will have a lower centre of mass than those with bigger shoulders. Speed climbers therefore optimise their strategy by keeping their centre of mass as close to the centre line as possible, maximising their upwards momentum. This results in new moves like the reza. While normally the starting strategy involves swinging out to the left to reach the fourth hold, Iranian climber Reza Alipur managed to completely bypass it in 2017. Keeping his trajectory on a straighter path helped him set a world record of 5.48 seconds. The record for speed climbing is becoming tougher as more climbers attempt it, but we can expect future breakthroughs to involve similar ways of optimising for a straight line upwards. A dearer sport to the Oxford heart that also involves optimising by travelling in straight lines is rowing. There are many different types of rowing boat. They can have one to eight rowers, they might have a cox who sits in the front and steers the boat, and they could be sweep stroke or sculling stroke. The last point is important because it affects the balance of the boat. The oars of sculling boats are placed or rigged symmetrically, while in sweep stroke there is a much greater distance between oars on alternate sides. This creates wiggle, where the different forces on the boat cause it to constantly drift slightly to one side. So, how do you optimise the rigging of a boat to eliminate wiggle? Well, let's set up our constant constraints and our variables. In a boat with no added weight from a cox, with four oars and a set distance between each oar, and assuming the rowers all have similar capabilities, what you can still change is the arrangement of oars. The conventional rigging arrangement is alternating left and right sides, or bow and stroke if you want to be fancy, but this doesn't mean it's the best way. We want to keep the boat balanced with the same number of oars on each side, but we could still change or arrangement to left, left, right, right, or left, right, right, left. The movement of each oar in a single stroke can be resolved into two directions of force, one in the direction opposite to forwards travel, and another perpendicular to this, which we can call the transverse force. The former force stays in the same direction throughout the stroke, while the latter transverse force changes from facing away to facing towards the boat, 
and this change is the basis of wiggle. Now, you can counteract wiggle using steering, or the rowers shifting their balance in the boat, but the preferred strategy is optimising the rigging to prevent wiggle from happening in the first place, so no energy is needed to counteract it. Calculating the total turning forces, or moments, on the boat created by each oar arrangement tells us that wiggle is greatest in the left-left-right-right arrangement, but the optimal arrangement is not the normal one, it's instead left-right-right-left. The benefits of this rig were discovered in the late 50s by an Italian crew who went on to win a gold medal in the 1956 Olympics. Once a simple optimization model has been created for this idealised situation, it can be manipulated to include different numbers of rowers and the possibility of having different numbers of oars on each side. Idealised situations may be removed from real life ones, but as seen here, they can also lead to Olympic gold. In this video, we've discussed three fairly different examples of optimization in real-world applications, but there are countless others in many different industries. Hopefully, you've now left behind the idea that optimization only relates to stuffy formula and abstract boxes. In reality, it can be as dynamic as a movement we've seen it describe. Another lesson we can take from this is the importance of collaboration with mathematicians in biology, sports science, engineering, and many more fields. Optimization problems can be found everywhere. Just set a goal, determine your options, and start asking questions.